All right, if you need a if you need a book, I got plenty up here. Um, and I considered this today. Um, I could probably just finish up the rest of these chapters and just stick them in here uh, since we're not doing anything in the middle of them. If you need a book, there's more than more than enough. Uh, if you want to take one of those books to somebody, um, unfortunately, I guess without the class, it's nothing more than just the King James Version of the Bible, but with some lines underneath it. But uh, if somebody wants one, they're absolutely more than welcome to have it. And uh, you can probably take that book uh, and make a good study out of it, as Brother Elkins used to tell us. So I find myself in Galatians chapter 2, verse number 11. Is that where you guys are? All right, so we're going to get into some stuff. The theme of the book of Galatians is that liberty does not give us the right to run, as they say in Alabama, hog wild. Y'all know what that means? Uh, we don't have the opportunity to just live however you want to just because you've been obedient. That's not, that's not the case at all. But there are certain liberties that are afforded to us that are not given to the world, and we should be advantageous with those things. Uh, it is the fact that in the first two chapters of this book, Paul will defend his apostleship against Judaizing teachers. The first night that we spoke about these people, we spoke that they had generally had three things they were kind of hung up on as Judaizing teachers. They said you could obey the gospel and one of two or three things and make sure you're, a, make sh you're, you're an extra Christian, I guess. Not just regular Christian, but you could be a, a, a better Christian if you did this. The three things were, number one, circumcision, circumcision right? Because that is really what God's looking for, those physical attributes that would make us, uh, or that would tell everyone else that we're in a covenant, right? So when you get, when you're, when you're, uh, when you're first baptized, you need to either brand or tattoo on your neck, I'm a Christian, right? No. What was the other thing they got hung up on? Holy days. Holy days, right? Uh, their, their big things were Passover and Pentecost and the Feast of Tents and the Feast of Wheat and, and all of these things. Interestingly, just this morning as I was reading, uh, I was reading a man who, who made a comment and he said, uh, it's amazing the amount of blood that was shed by the, uh, is the Israelite nation over the years was there would be daily sacrifices, daily sacrifices. And the question he posed, which was rhetorical in and of itself, was how much blood would ever be enough for, for God? And the answer is 1.2 gallons. They just hadn't shed right 1.2 Alan, yet. And so they get hung up, or they were getting hung up on um, circumcision. They were getting hung up on holy days. And what was the third thing they were getting hung up on? Diet. diet. That's right, diet. Uh, you can't eat those things. You can't have a sausage biscuit. Because the good biscuits are made out of lard, right? Well, that's one reason, but the other reason, sausage. You can't have those things that you and I uh, especially the southern portion of you and I just look at it and go, oh, it was just kind of happen every day. It, it, their diet was so different uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think, for a safety issue, and but I think that's secondary. But I think the main issue was I want you to be visibly different from the nations that are around you. And one of those ways to do that is diet. If you see four or five people walking around uh, eating a bacon sandwich and you, this guy not, you're going to say, what's wrong with that guy? 
And so they're getting hung up on those things. We're going to run in tonight to Peter, and we may not make it very far scripturally tonight, but I hope we can understand the mindset of Peter as we go through this. Now, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now, the lovely Miss Brandy and I spoke about this driving home, I guess it was, last week. And both sides are speculation. Both, neither side may be correct. With this just kind of what you, you think when you read, we stood him to the face. There are some who would think that he would sort of run up and be ag aggressively charging Peter to his face with something. I guess it could happen that way. Still others would think that perhaps he pulled Peter and the group off to the side and they talked face to face. It really wasn't everybody's deal. It was just their deal. Uh, however it happened, I don't know. But this is what I do know. What Paul sees Peter doing is wrong or is it just Paul's opinion that it's wrong. It was hypocrisy. It, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's hypocrisy. It's looking at people differently uh, simply because of where they grew up. Um, I've told you uh, on occasion about preaching in Alabama in those small towns growing up there. You know, we didn't really even consider it. You go back and you go, why are there two churches here in a town of 800 people? And it would be a black church and a white church. Why? Well, either side would say, because well, we don't want them worshiping with us. Well, you, you've got big problems there. Th this is the same mindset that Peter is going to have here. For before, this is verse 12, the certain came from James, he, Peter, did eat with the Gentiles. And when they, those certain, had come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. So understand what he's doing. We're having a giant picnic, and everybody's eating with everybody. Y'all remember uh, picnic on the grounds? We had the concrete tables that were about this high, and everybody just stood there and ate. Y'all from the West, you may not realize that. It was a good time good time. A chicken sat out there, chicken salad, till it was almost deadly. <laughs> you, would, you would just eat with whoever was around, and, and it was just a good time, and you'd move down the line and eat with somebody else, or move up the line, eat with somebody else. And so what they're having is just a, a, a giant fellowship meal, and they're, they're enjoying each other's company. They, they have an opportunity to talk about how did, where were you, how did you grow up, uh, you know, what did you learn in school, all those kinds of things. And everything's going well. Everything's going fine until the Judaizing teacher shows up. Now, this is my opinion, and you can take it or leave it. I don't care. I'm not convinced that perhaps Peter didn't know this Judaizing teacher from previous life. He cut it off mighty quick. This is not what we do, Peter. It's not what who does. It's not what the Jew does. Now, is the Judaizing teacher right when he said, when he makes the statement, this is not what the Jew does? Uh, unfortunately, that is a correct statement. But now he's lumped a Christian in there, and he says, this is not what we do. This is exactly what the Christian does. It's just a meal. Does it matter that much? On the grand scheme of things, looking at it as just a meal, perhaps it doesn't matter that much. But in the isolated event where they were, it meant a lot. It, it, was, it was going to set the tone one way or another for how 
that congregation of mostly Gentile people were going to suppose that not only uh, other Jewish Christians would act, but also the apostles. Now, don't forget that this is the guy. You know, he's the, the one that everybody in the world says is the, the head apostle. He's the one that we have the, the sermon from in Acts chapter 2, although I think the other 11 were up preaching the same thing. He's the one. He's the one who was and is known as the rock. He's the one. And now he does this. He pulls away when the people from the Jewish community come over as if the Gentile ain't worth it. As if it's okay if I'm friends with these people while nobody can see. I have a friend back home, and he preaches at the Jennifer Church of Christ. That's the black congregation in Munford. And his name is Jeff Jemison. And Jeff Jemison is a little bit taller than that door, and his shoulders are just a little bit wider than that door. And if I saw him right now, I'd hug his neck. And he might be the darkest individual I ever met in my life. And I love him to death. Uh, he loves to sing. I love to sing. He likes uh, suits and shoes. And I like suits and shoes. And I like it when he calls me his brother from another mother. I love that. That's my guy. I would hug him if the president was in the room or if nobody was in the room. There's no bearing on who he is to me based on who is around. And that's the issue that Peter's having. It's okay that I could talk and hang out with Jeff as long as no white people are around. That, that's ultimately the, the rub here. And the fact of the matter is, I'm, I think I'd rather hang out with Jeff. <laughs> I know some of y'all, but I'd like to hang out with Jeff too. You'd like him too if you met him. Is it okay? Would it be okay if I went to our local black congregation? Would that be okay? Would it be okay if they came here? Would it be okay if we just joined together? Or would it only be okay if Brandy didn't go with me? Is it okay if I sing with them uh, in the manner in which they like to sing? Oh, yeah. I like it, too. Is it okay if I sing with you in the manner in which you like to sing? Brethren, the issue is this. Does geography or hue of your skin, either one, does it matter that much? When you read through the New Testament, you're going to see God put people in two categories and only two categories. Are you ready? You're either a saint or you ain't. You like how those go together? You're either lost or saved. Well, what color are they? Who cares? Where do they live? Who cares? Are they lost or are they saved? Are they a brother or a sister in Christ or not? Peter has given up the to look at it that way in order to take the opportunity to be prejudiced, prejudging something. Well, what's he prejudging? Is he prejudging the Gentile? Maybe. Is he prejudging the Jew who comes up and says, well, you might think this about me? Well, maybe. Either way, he's got enough to spread around. Look at verse 13. And the other Jew is with him likewise, in so much that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. Notice what he's saying here. When Peter backed away, 
That was a sign to the rest of those Jewish Christians, either because he is a uh, one to follow as a Jew or because he's an apostle, that we need to back up to. Chances are they never even thought about it. Chances are the, the binds, or the, yeah, the ties would have been so strong that bound them together that they may never even thought about it until Peter. And now they have pulled back so far that Joseph, the one who is named Barnabas, the son of consolation or exhortation, kind of looks at him and says, am I supposed to be going too? Now, one man's sinful action, that's, which is what it is, preferring one over another, one man's sinful action has had a ripple effect on the people who were working there with Peter and Paul. Not only has it had that ripple effect uh, as they're having this meal, it now has had a ripple effect between the people who would have been working with Paul exclusively, who have just been working with Gentiles, and then those who have just been working with Peter exclusively. This one little thing. When we as the church... Try to pull back the truth and modify it a little bit to match a little closer to what the world does. It has rippling effects throughout our congregation, throughout our community, throughout our home. And just as much as Peter is wrong in doing what he did, we as a church can be wrong by pulling these things or those things that way because what's the next step after that? What's the next step with Peter after he pulls back from eating? What's, what's the next step after that? Then, then they just don't deal with that church, them as a church anymore because they're Gentiles. We just stick with the Jews. Let, let me go ahead and uh, let you know about this since uh, you might not, um, but you can see it everywhere. The word heaven is mentioned in the New Testament. There ain't no Jew or Gentile heaven. There ain't no black or white heaven. There ain't no male or female heaven. There is either heaven or hell, and we're either working our way toward heaven or we're working our way toward hell. And here you have a division due to, well, lack of better things, hypocrisy. Yes, ma'am. Is this because this, there's a set of the Pharisees that accepted the gospel, but they weren't willing to give up their custom and tradition of Judaism? Yes. And was Peter trying to satisfy them and go along with them? Um, yes, on a, on a somewhat, somewhat simplified scale about the second question. Uh, that's, that's exactly what's going on. But he was being a hypocrite because he was going along with the same things that he condemns. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, he was, and it would, be, it would be Peter who in Acts chapter 10 has that, that sheet let down, and God remind him three times, what I have called clean, don't you call unclean, and if I tell you to eat it, you go ahead and eat it. And he still couldn't get past that idea. In Acts chapter 11, when he goes to Cornelius' house, he can't get past that idea. This is not just some, some sort of idea that Peter has. Now, you tell me how Southern this sounds. This has been taught to him his whole life. 
And he's having to unlearn some things that were culturally fine that are not culturally fine with God. Yes, sir. Well, it says he did it out of fear, though. Yeah, yeah. At, at this point, you have you have some fear going on, and I think the fear is, what are they going to tell people back home? Now we don't know. We're never told exactly what that fear is, and I guess it could be, I guess it could be fear for his. I don't. I, I, I guess his life. I don't know if it had come to that point. Um, but I think his, his fear is, what are they going to say about me back in Jerusalem? But he is going to have to unlearn some things, just like we have to unlearn some things in the South. We have to unlearn they have a church and we have a church. We have to unlearn uh, that brown skin and white skin is different. It's still skin. Interesting side note for you. Did you know the uh, the doctor who created uh, blood transfusions, you know, the process of transfusing blood, was a black man? Did you know he died after a car wreck because they wouldn't let him in the whites-only hospital and he needed a transfusion? Are you serious? No, I'm making that up. Yes, yes, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, but that's where we are e even in the South, aren't we? There's some things we have to unlearn, and, and it's not easy. It's not going to be easy for Peter, but when you get down and you're reading into First and Second Peter, you're dealing with an older an elder who's seen a lot of stuff and has grown a lot. Now, right now, we're in his growth process. But when I saw, this is 14, that they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. And notice what Paul says. It's not that I think they should have stayed where they were. They were not walking uprightly to the truth of the gospel. Either the blood of Jesus Christ washes and saves every man and woman who will accept that underneath God's terms, or it only does it for Jews. And Peter or Paul says to him, look, you can't preach that it's for everybody and then not want to hang out with everybody. It's just how that goes. I said unto Peter before them all, all of the people around, if thou be being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? Notice what he's asking, maybe less confusing terms. If it's okay for you, Jew, to live like a Gentile, why is it not okay for the Gentiles, or why are you making the Gentiles live like Jews? Why are you making them and forcing them underneath that, that old law? Why are you making them observe those days? Why are you making them... Uh, uh, circumcise those sons and, and do all of these things that would put them in that Jewish mindset. It's either saved or lost, isn't it? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, verse 16, 16, 15 and 16, is a prime example of the idea that we mentioned in the beginning of uh, this introduction where P or Paul is going to use the phrase uh, law and faith to denote either that Old Testament faith or that New Testament system of faith. Uh, understand first, and uh, obviously, that faith doesn't, uh, a working faith in God doesn't change from Adam forward. But he's using this in this book to denote the differences between living underneath the Old Testament law or living underneath the New Testament law. So while we read that, we're going to change uh, um, phrases like works of the law to Old Testament. Are you ready? 
Knowing that a man is not justified by the Old Testament, but by the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Even we believe that Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the New Testament and not by the Old Testament. For the Old Testament shall no flesh be justified. Can I keep that Old Testament law? If, if in theory it was possible, if I were able to keep it perfectly, living in the time which I live, would that be satisfactory to God? No. Why? That old law been fulfilled. It did its job. As a matter of fact, this particular book will tell us what its job was, chapter 3. But it has done its job and it's no longer in force. But the New Testament, as he will mention here, is the testament by which God saves man. Now, stop right there for a minute, and I want you to... Th we'll try. We'll try. I, I want you to try to wrap your mind around this idea and consider this. Adam lived 930 years. Do you know about him? He named the animals... He had a wife named Eve. They did some bad stuff. They had at least three sons. That's all you know, right? That's pretty much all we're told within the confines of the Scripture, right? All right, somebody's going to shake or nod. Okay, good, good. You think he did more than that in the 930 years he lived? When Adam is mentioned and when his family is mentioned in the New Testament, especially in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, with Abel, they're mentioned as being uh, faithful. What about Abraham? Well, we know a lot about Abraham. We know about his extra wife and his child. Mm -hmm. We know a lot of those kinds of things. You think that's the only thing Abel did, or Abraham did that would be uh, negative toward God or positive when you look at his life? No. Look at David and you say, yeah, David was the man after God's own heart. He, he defended Israel, all those kinds of things. Bathsheba, yeah, it was kind of bad, but we'll just skip over that. You think it was the only thing he ever did that was uh, sinful toward God? No. Think that was the only thing he ever did that was righteous toward God? No. You know how, how big of a book this would be to have all of those exploits written down just second by second? So the question I'm asking you is this. If you have righteous people to God all the way back to the garden, and they die before Jesus is even born, how would they say What say ye? I don't know is an okay answer. It's, and it's all right. Say, uh, you, you handle this one, preacher, it's all right. But think about this for a moment. As far as the gospel had been revealed Abraham, did he follow it? Is he responsible for stuff he doesn't know, not even been told of by God? No. Was he responsible for that? Yes. As far as the gospel was revealed to Adam, did he follow it? Except for that fruit thing, right? He followed the gospel that was, was um, uh, revealed to him as far as he knew it. What about David? Yep, as far as he knew it. What about Isaiah? Sure, as far as he knew it. Did that make them saved underneath God's plan? Were they obedient and faithful? Isn't that the criteria even today? As long as they were obedient and faithful, the blood of Jesus Christ flows from that point of, of his body forward to us and backward to them. Well, where were they before that? You talking about 
you, are you talking about in death? The answer is, I don't know. I ain't died yet. I can't tell you what happens after this life. And here's what I know. If they are faithfully and obediently following God, God will save them. That has always been his platform for mankind from the garden. Now, how does he do it in the Old Testament? I don't know. How do he do it underneath the patriarchal age? I don't know, and I don't have to know. Because just like James, I'm going to stay in my lane. And I'm going to let God do what he does, how he does it, because that's his job. Remember Deuteronomy 29, 29? The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed to us to keep the law and to do those things. So how exactly God... Um, Uh, adopted, if you'll allow me to use that, the blood from the cross backward, I'm not sure. But let me, let me try to answer it. I think the key to it is found in Acts chapter 17. In verse number 30. I have a question. Go ahead. Is it safe to say that Acts was written about 15 years after Galatians? 15, 20 years? Written? Probably right around that. Written, yes. I think Acts in its uh, timing where it's actually happening is before Galatians. But written down, it's written down about 15 years after. Okay, so when Peter did this, or yeah, when Peter's doing this and Paul's getting mad at him, has Acts 2 happened yet? Yes. Yes. Acts 2 is up. I, I, I would contend that all of Acts has already happened. <coughs> well, not all of Acts, because Peter goes off in Acts and dies, or goes over yonder to Rome. He, he's headed toward death that way, but uh, you're looking at probably 18 at least, maybe 20. Of 28 chapters? 18 of 28 chapters? So chapter 10 and 11 have already taken place yeah. chronologically. That's, that's correct. Let me get over here on my little blue letter Bible because there's something I want you to look at that ain't in my King James. All right. Here, I want you to look at that part. <laughs> Does that help you all out any? just a bunch of Greek stuff. All right, so verse 30 says this, and at the times of this God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. That's the old school 1611 King James Version. Hyperano is the word we're looking at, and it's translated as winked at. And that ain't where it's going to be. This one says overlooked. Yeah, that's the one. Where's that one? ESV. ESV has it, has it right. The King James Version on that particular word in translation has it where it um, could confuse. Because when you read in the King James where it says, at the times of this ignorance God winked at, we look at it as God going, that's that's all right. Let's just sweep that under the rug. That's okay. You don't have doesn't have to that don't have to apply to you. Yes, ma'am. New King James version has overlooked. Overlooked is the right version, is the right uh, translation. At the times of the ignorance of man, of the completed gospel, God overlooks. But now he commends all men everywhere to repent. And if you take it at what we understand overlooked at. At face value, you say, yeah, but isn't that about the same thing as sweeping it under the rug? Well, yeah. But the problem is you're looking at it in 2024. Take the two words overlooked and pull them apart. And then flip them. At the times of the ignorance of man, God looked over it and looked down the line of history to the cross. 
and knew what was coming and knew what would be coming backward. He didn't overlook it. He didn't sweep it under the rug. He didn't give him the old good old boy nudge. What he did was look over the top of it down through the line of history and see the cross. All the way from the garden, brethren, listen to me. All the way from before the garden. <laughs> that was happening from eternity. Jesus Christ knew that was happening from eternity. And here you have God looking over, looking over the top of the sinful activity that's going on below and seeing the redemption of man down that line and how it's going to flow back to those who are faithfully obedient. Looking down, seeing that cross of redemption for mankind and seeing how that blood is going to flow forward for us. Our problem is we like to hamstring God in time. Can't be done. God is superior to time. He made time. And so he does he is not um, hamstrung by that time. But if we in Galatians 2, verse 17, but if we, while seeking to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Let's look at the, let's look at the question first. Is, is Jesus Christ the minister or the servant of sin? It's 50-50. Who says yes? Well, that's good. Who says no? All right, and so the, either the other of you are not going to participate or you're in the I don't know camp. Which one is it? I'm not going to participate. Okay, that's where y'all are. <coughs> All right, you didn't even participate in that. Jesus the Christ is not, is not, is not the minister or the servant of sin. In order to be that, he would have to have sin. If he has sin, hey, he ain't Christ. And we are wasting time. If he is a servant or a minister of sin, you need to put your Bible down and walk away from it because none of it's true. But because he has no sin, because he is not tainted with that, he is not the minister of sin. And because he is not the minister of sin, he doesn't justify us in our sin. He justifies us out of our sin. You know what that means? You can come to Christ a sinner, but you can't stay there. At some point in time, you've got to move. That movement starts at the point where you say, I'm going to be obedient unto God, and you start following after his word. That's when the movement starts. Sometimes we move back. Well, that's when we need a good brother or sister to give us a jolt and say, what are you doing, son? You're supposed to be moving forward. You're moving back. And if, if Christ is a minister of sin, then he'll save us in our sin. And that's no possible way. For if we build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. If I build back the things that I have destroyed, if I have taken my sin and I have put it in the box, and I have thrown it in the ocean to say, I'm never going to do those things again. I'm going to live a life after Christ and I bring them back. What am I now? I'm just as lost as I was. That's where I am. I'm just as lost as I was. Well, we have the, the term unfaithful Christian. Yeah, you are. You're still a child of his, absolutely. We look at that phrase and we think that's more palatable. And, and perhaps it is because we don't understand the phrase unfaithful. What I have done is accept the saving grace of God through his plan. I have put Christ on in baptism. I have decided to live that life. And so I put all that sin in that box and thrown it away. Until one day, 
I get that box back out and I empty all of those things out of it. I, I love to do that one. I, I like to do that one too and that one. And instead of putting those sins in, keeping them in that box, I've taken my e eternality of heaven with God and I've taken it off and put it in that box. And I've changed it for these things. You can either have one out of the box or another out of the box, but you can't have both. You can't be a somewhat faithful Christian. You're either faithful or you're not. I mean, that's just the long and the short of it. If I go back to my old life, then I make myself a transgressor, one who has gone beyond the lines, one who's gone out of bounds. And so I find myself not wanting to do that, do I? For through the law, I am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Through the law, I'm dead to the law. What? Switch those, switch those words out again. Through the Old Testament, I'm dead to the Old Testament. What time period did Jesus live in, Old or New Testament? Look at your Bibles. Old. Right? Ha, that was a trick. Ha, ha. The New Testament doesn't start to ja Acts chapter 2, does it? Jesus is a Jew living underneath the Old Testament law. Jesus dies as a Jew underneath the Old Testament law. From the law, I have the salvation of man through the law. Yeah, you sure do. And then time changes. There you find it. And then we find our favorite verse. Y'all know this one, don't you? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. If you'll look through there, you'll notice how many times Christ is mentioned and how many times I am mentioned. I, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ. Those things are interchangeable. Paul, say, Paul says here, I am physically alive. I am the one who is walking around for God. I am the physical tool. But it's no longer my will. It's the will of Christ. Well, and where does that put the will of God? Same place. What was the mindset of Christ? Look at him in Matthew 26. Don't look at Matthew 26 too hard, we're going to look at that Sunday. But look at it, Matthew 26. He was in the garden. And the, the first thing, the full prayer we have, the first one he says, he says, uh, it's not my will, but thine be done. God, Christ was going to do God's will because they're one and the same. If I am following Christ, if I am his physical tool here, then it's his mindset that lives in me. And when it stops, I am no longer working for him. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Mark verse, you want to come back to verse 20. Mark verse 20, and we'll finish those thoughts out next week. Chop. Time needs to slow down just a little bit. That'll be all right too.